And there he is, John Anik, the host of the Anik and Florian podcast. Merch is blowing up. The show's blowing up. The shows are blowing up because they've added, obviously, to uh, the network, we'll call it. And uh, can't say enough about his broadcasting skills behind the mic there with the UFC. What's going on, John? How are you, sir? Always great to be with you guys. The question is, does my new studio work? Can you actually hear the microphone? Yes, I look sharp and everything. So I have a backup set up to my right that I'm going to shut down right now, but I figure one of my first interviews in this new studio, which happens to be in my master bedroom, which I guess is neither here nor there, but should be with you guys, the long standing hosts of the longest standing radio show in the history of mixed martial arts. So it's good to be with you boys as always, albeit from uh, a new setup. I can, uh, I mean, I got sound effects boys. Like we're ready to go. <laughs> nice I love hot. it. Looks tight, man. We love it. Uh, did the wife have a problem with you invading the master bedroom? See, Goes always asks me very hard questions, but here you are hitting me with the hard question off the top, right? So this probably won't do much for your listeners, but I have like a three shot camera and, you know, my I can't pan over to my bed. But yeah, there were some navigations with the wife. We're still going to probably put a separator of some kind in here. Uh, oh. But some of these Florida houses, man, not really built optimistically or I should say perfectly. And there's no basement. So we just kind of got to make do. And, uh, so here we are in the master bedroom, but yeah, we need some separation like yesterday. <laughs> well, I always try and strategize and get you out of time. I know you're a family guy with whether the kids might be in school already. Breakfast has been done and we obviously appreciate you jumping on with us. How was your new year? Anything special? Uh, do you, are you a resolutions guy? You know, I'm trying to not have any juice in January, no juice January, which is particularly difficult down here in South Florida with all of the amazing Florida orange juice. As long as you have protein like eggs first, you're actually okay. I'm just trying to get rid of juice. We're taking the resolutions month by month, right? No wide ranging proclamations about what I'm going to do or not do for the year, but no juice for January. And thank you. It was a good new, new year. I hope everybody had a nice holiday. My UFC schedule through the first three quarters of 2023 was particularly intensive. So I'm actually in a stretch right now. I hope my boss isn't watching, right? But one show in October, one show in November, one show in December, and one show in January. So it was a much needed respite. And uh, I feel re-energized. I feel ready to go to Toronto and Saudi Arabia and everywhere else. He calls the shot stills, or do you have some juice? How about that? Uh, when it comes to, you know, looking at the schedule and going, oh, I wouldn't mind going to Mexico. The fans bring it. I wouldn't mind going to Riyadh and debuting in Saudi Arabia. Like, how does that come into play? So I'm a full-time employee, which is not the reality for a lot of my broadcast partners. As such, they call my number. I go. I was booked for Mexico City on February 24th. I was very excited to get back there and call fights there. Uh, my schedule was switched, I think, given the gravity of this Saudi Arabia show. Pretty rare that I would do a show of that magnitude leading into a pay-per-view as we'll go March 2nd in Saudi Arabia and then March 9th in Miami. But uh, I'm happy to have them call my number for the big shows or any show and uh, just trying to earn it every show uh, for better or for worse, as you guys all well know. Mm -hmm. Isn't it a thing of beauty when, you know, as of about, what, a month and a half ago, two months, we already knew how the cards were filling up, 297, 298. We got back to having the seasonal press conferences as well. I'm sure that also helps you organize things as well. Everyone knows part of John Annick's foundation is the preparation. Yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here looking at a UFC 297 Strickland versus Duplessis fight car that was sent to me by my boss, Zach Candido. It hasn't been distributed distributed to the masses. The bout order actually hasn't even been approved. But to your point, we try to get ahead of it as much as possible. And uh, it's a huge benefit, luxury for me to have this type of downtime on the front end of a pay-per-view, right? Can you imagine if I can't show up prepared come January 17th when I get to Toronto, just given that uh, I have essentially these two weeks right now to get ready? So we're excited. You know, I had to sit down with Drake as Duplessis recently in Las Vegas, and we'll sit down with him again on the Anakin Florian podcast. We got Mike Malak coming up as well. And uh, it's interesting, right? Because this card has had a few sort of uh, deflections or subtractions, and you know, we're trying to bring it in Toronto, and I promise fans this event is going to deliver, but I know some people are upset that Jan Bohovic and Carlos Olberg and Dominic Reyes and the likes are not walking through that door. Yeah. Did uh, Have you already been told if you're going to do the pre-fight press conference? No, I'm. that is uh, – so sometimes I'll have some advance notice. Great question. And sometimes I'll be 
sitting in a hot tub uh, in a penthouse suite at the Virgin. And 30 minutes later, you'll see me sweating <laughs> through a suit because Dana White couldn't be there. So I'm always happy when they call my number, honestly. Uh, I want to be up there when he can't be there. And thankfully, right now, they call my number when he can't be there. So I don't know about Toronto, but I will be uh, ready, willing, and able if indeed they call my number. And uh, same can be said for Anaheim and uh, and everywhere else. But yeah, I've been packing extra suits and uh, treat it like an on-call situation. When I worked at ESPN, we had one on-call shift a month. And man, you were hoping they didn't call your number for that graveyard shift. <laughs> you always look ready, John, but I got to be honest with you. You don't always look comfortable, and I think you know what I'm getting at. And some of these press conferences have gotten a little wild, you know, controversial, line-stepping. I've heard what you said about, hey, look, you know, I've been a part of it, too. We know how chaos, you know, came at you and the family and things like that. Um, but, you know, Goz and I were just talking about uh, how, how can we make sure that I guess this is the limit that because the lines just keep getting crossed. And I told goes, you'd be a great guy to ask this question to because you're not just an MMA guy. You're a sports guy. You'll obviously remember Bo versus Galata won in the mid 90s. Um, you'll remember the, ma the, pa the malice at the palace in the early 2000s. I don't want something like that for our sport. Uh, we had a, a taste of it with during the Habib and uh, Conor McGregor rivalry. We had something had go down in Brooklyn, something at the T-Mobile. We even had something between Jones and and uh, DC at the uh, MGM hotel in the lobby. Um, that was you, by the way. No, I'm just kidding. That, that's an old <laughs> Dave Schaller joke. It's a don't Dave Schaller joke. Just, just, just joking. Um, I'll retire it. That was the last time. No, but you, you don't want to get in that, right? We don't want to cross yeah. more lines, bro. So I am up there trying to execute the company's vision, Dana White's vision. And I'll look at a press conference like we had, I think in Miami where Jorge Masvidal and Kevin Holland were not competing against one another. And they started going at it back and forth and Dana White intervened. You guys aren't even fighting, wanted to move things forward. And the next time I saw him, I said, I'm glad it was you and not me up there because in that situation, I probably would have let that go. And now here to four, I kind of know that you don't necessarily like when athletes that are not competing against one another start to go at it. Uh, maybe was it Manel Cop and Israel Adesanya, right? So yeah, I've been up there for a lot of different situations. And this one was particularly unique when it came to Leon Edwards and Colby Covington. In that moment, I'm not necessarily thinking that uh, that a perpetual line crosser like Colby Covington has crossed a line here that he hasn't crossed before. I'm not thinking in the moment that this is the worst thing that has come out of his m mouth. I'm thinking about Leon Edwards' emotional reaction. And uh I'm just trying to sort of do what I can, you know, in that setting. And if I really feel like there's an opportunity where I have to interject and shut things down, uh, then I will. I don't have a producer in my ear. You know, largely I have carte blanche up there. And, uh, you know, you just hope when you see the boss at the way and the next day, he's not like, dude, why didn't you let that fucking go? Right. I mean, the worst thing I could probably do would be to shut off something that could be promotionally useful. But it is what it is uh, as far as your overreaching theme or point about, you know, things going sideways. If I'm being honest, you know, I want things to go nuts when I'm in that arena. Not that I want a Mexico city type situation necessarily with bottles flying, but you know, I want madness, my man. I want craziness in all forms. So yeah, I think obviously we don't want to throw objects that could hurt people and we don't want to say things about people's families, I guess, in a broad sense. Um, but I'm all for chaos if I'm really answering that question truthfully. And so am I. I. I love it, but with limits, I just don't want a kid or a senior to get hurt. Is what it well, well, how did you guys feel when Colby Covington said, you know, John and kids might grow up without a dad, right? Because when I first, when it first crossed my beak and I read the transcript, I didn't think anything of it. Maybe when I saw him later uh, and sort of saw some of the anger with which he said it, I thought, oh, you know, that's not ideal. But I felt like he was playing a character. It didn't sort of mess with my meter at all. Mm -hmm. It bothered me. Uh, it bothered yeah. me. Yeah, I didn't like yeah. it. I, 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 just, I feel like there's so many things you can say uh, without having to just kind of go go down certain dark alleys. Go ahead, Ghost. Well, you're not a fighter, so the first thing that popped into my head was John doesn't deserve this. He's he's got his job that he's got to do, and his job isn't really relatable to what Colby Covington does. Colby Covington yeah. steps into a cage and fights someone. He doesn't deserve to be on that same uh, level and have to worry about those things let alone his family. So it, it did bother me, but I'm going to tell you something, John. Look, maybe I've grown a little soft in my age. 
Me too, but buddy. I, I've, I've said this a lot on this show. Um, when we were born, there was already an NFL. There was an NHL. There was an MLB. There was an NBA. And our mothers and fathers and uncles and aunts told us stories of the greats of their times and all that. We are very lucky that we can say we not only saw a sport grow under our watch, but we helped make it happen. And I think because of that is why fans and media grasp onto it really tight because we don't want to see it become something that we worked so hard to make it look like all these other sports to get to that level. It's always going to have its own edge and that's okay. It's supposed to, it's the fight game, but we don't want it to, to become something else because we all fought very hard to get it to this point. A lot of us, uh, we're not getting paid for a very long time doing these types right. of things. And so we just get scared that one day it's going to cross the line. That's going to be very hard to come back from. And so yeah. when I when I see somebody like you that I respect so much in this game, and I, I tell it to you off air, and I tell it to you on air, we are very impressed with everything you've been able to do, and we're very happy for you. When we see things like that happen to one of our guys, it, it hurts us just as much as uh, maybe it, it, it can hurt you. So. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know if I've just become soft in my age, but no. my, first, my first reaction is you can't talk to my boy like that. And then my then after a while, maybe I calm down. And I go, yeah, it goes, it is the fight game. But I just never wanted to cross into that line where where things just get really bad. Yeah, no, and John, I John before, you chime in, go ahead. before you chime in, let me just say the corniness of pro wrestling. God, I hope I don't get heat for that comment. But how about just The Rock saying, you know, you get out of line, I'm going to take you to the corner. What is it? Jabroni Drive and Know Your Roll Boulevard. And the fans pop over that same line for 20 years. That's what I'm getting at. We can get it. We can be a little harder than that because obviously the UFC is as real as it gets. You know, those are some real, some real stuff that's going down. I get that. I'm not trying to say let's just uh, be Disneyland, right? Right. Uh, I, but – you know, remember when Diego shoved jo uh, Josh Koscheck UFC 68? He almost fell off. It was Bruce Buffer that caught him. I don't want to lose fights. I don't want to lose fights, and I don't want innocent fans that pay a lot of money to just get hurt. You know what I'm saying? But other than that, I like chaos too. So yeah, I'm like goes. I'm a little soft, especially around the belly. Although I'm working on it every day. I fight obesity, by the way. But but at the same huh. time, uh, I've seen other sports just have those take those steps back because of you know path. Well, let me path. tell you this. And goes, if you want to jump in, go ahead. I just want to add one last thing. And this is the part that kind of scares me. Uh, growing up, George and I were, uh, people don't know, we're brothers. But we were also class clowns. And we did a lot of things. But we kind of knew our limit and where we could go before we would get into some serious trouble. Yeah. But our friends didn't always know those limits. Yeah. So they would see us do something stupid. And they would say, I want to do that. And they yeah. would do it. And they would take it too far. And something would happen, yeah. And the class would 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 fall back because of it. We'd have to stay extra time or detentions or write a an extra paper. I just there are certain people that probably know their limits when it comes to trash talk and all that stuff, but there are there are fighters that just don't. And one day they are going to see somebody else do it and go, "I'm going to do that too," and they're going to take it too far. And that's what scares me. Yeah. No, those are all fair points. So boxing is ubiquitously accepted in this country. Boxing is a sport that predates all of our lives, and it has a level of acceptance internally at ESPN that we don't even have right now with mixed martial arts, even though they are our partner. There are battles that I was fighting for mixed martial arts in 2007 in those buildings, and there were executives fighting a lot harder than I was, but as the host of MMA Live, I was fighting for MMA. We're still fighting some of those battles, right? There's still some people, to your sort of point goes, that are always going to just look at MMA as either too violent for them, as superficially violent as it may be. You know, I guess I I get more worried about Jeremy Stevens pushing Drakkar close into a concussion because he's wearing slides and not expecting of that blow than maybe some of the verbal back and forth. But yeah, I mean, Colby, Co Co Colby Covington's comments about Leon Edwards' father were absolutely disgusting. Right. Uh, and yeah, more vile than certainly him injecting my children into the equation and more relevant because he's fighting Leon Edwards and not me. Um, I guess I just uh, I feel like not pessimistic, but like, dude, like we're going to always have to fight for for this particular combat sport. You know, because of, uh, you know, even like Josh Emmett against Bryce Mitchell, right? You know, there are people who will use that as a jumping off point to uh, to preach negativity about this sport, you know, and um, the NFL has 
you know, dozens upon dozens of worse head injuries than that every Sunday and, you know, leads the late night news. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about UFC 297. We got Sean Strickland versus Drikas Duplessis. Uh, I mean, gosh, it's the buildup is just there. And it's been, again, a little bit of some line stepping or whatever you want to call it, but organic. Um, and then you got a division that's full of some other contenders. I mean, I think the middleweight division is really, really going to pop uh, this year. I wanted to ask you, Drikas Duplessis, he had this surgery like uh, mid-year, I think. And supposedly now that heavy breathing, that labored breathing we used to see, it's not going to be like some sort of a factor. But in observing him, right, do you think if this guy fight goes 25 minutes, can he hang with Sean Strickland's activity? I think the championship rounds, it stands to reason, would be hard, even if Strakis Duplessis is the hardest worker in the room. I just sat down with him, as I mentioned, in Vegas, and one of the questions I asked him was, did we make too much of this deviated septum procedure in terms of how it might have affected your cardiovascular base? And he said, yeah, we probably made too much of it, but then he went on to talk for probably 120 seconds about all the wide-ranging benefits from that surgery. So I do think it stands to reason that uh, it has opened up his nose, but also opened up his mind and opened up his confidence a little bit. You know, maybe there was some sort of mental hurdle that now he has uh, he has gotten over. But man, Sean Strickland, obviously Teddy Atlas's line has been repeatedly trotted out there that once you become a champion, as Leon Edwards did, you get 20 to 30% better or whatever the range may be. And it's a combination of factors that make you better, right? The confidence gained or accrued from winning that championship. Then the ensuing training camp really is usually pretty good in advance of that first title defense. Everything really is probably taken up a notch uh, when you become the hunted and I don't know. I just think it's exciting to think about how much better Sean Strickland could get based upon what he did to Israel Adesanya because I don't love that rematch for Izzy, right, in terms of what that matchup is. And I just think Strickland is going to be so, so buoyed what by what he was able to do in Sydney, Australia. So, gosh, my my excitement level for that fight, fellas, is just, is just off the charts. I can't wait. And we didn't even need them to go at it in the stands for me to be uh, that hyped. Big time. Big time. You know, you brought up Teddy Atlas. And something Teddy Atlas said about Mike Tyson made me wonder a little bit about yourself, because sometimes when we say things in public, we don't always get to express everything we mean about it. And people just jump down your neck. Right. And so, you know, what he said was that he didn't really think Mike Tyson was all that great. And we grew up in the same era, John. Mike Tyson was a menace. Right. But there are some truths to some of the things he says once you, you hear the explanation a little bit more. I still disagree, but I was going to I was going to ask you, John, how difficult is that situation knowing that you want to express yourself, but at the same time, you just open yourself up to so much, you know, people uh, taking your words and, and, and turning it into something else. Uh, can you maybe share a moment when that's happened to you or yeah. is that even anything that goes through your mind of you? kind of gotten past all that yet? I don't worry too much about that. You know, even when I go deep on Colby Covington and Leon Edwards, you know, the next thing you know, sometimes I'm going to a website and uh, and there's a story written about that particular comment. For me, it's not so much about having my words twisted as much as maybe having my words sensationalized, but I'm not afraid to stick myself out there. And after Israel Adesanya beats Alex Pade to suggest that he's the greatest middleweight champion of all time, and I'm okay with all the Anderson Silva venom that comes my way. And Perhaps there's a recency bias with me having called the bulk of Izzy's career against what I believe to be a higher level era of middleweight. Uh, but there have been a lot of times where I've said things that I think are uh, maybe too much in the moment or too presumptuous. Like you just didn't need to assess Izzy versus Anderson at that point in time, especially when one man's body of work is complete. Right. And it wasn't necessarily me trying to put Izzy over as much as me was trying to laud this particular era, the Marvin Vittori's of the world that I think would have provided a real challenge for Anderson Silva. So, you know, I guess for me, it was like once Sean Strickland beat Izzy, it's like, all right, well, maybe we need to reassess and eras aren't complete yet here. So, uh, but, you know, I think it happens every now and again. And uh, 
I guess my my as much as I have softened goes in my advanced age here at 45, my skin has gotten thicker. And uh, even when it comes awards time, right? And Leon Edwards is my fight of the year, and people think I'm dunking on Islam Akashev and Sean Strickland. Well, Ken Flo gets to pick first. He pick, he gave Sean Strickland three of his fucking ten awards, right? So like Strickland was off the board, you know. He picked Islam Akashev for fighter of the year. You know, it is what it is. I didn't have any hardware for Sean because Kenny gave it all away. But uh, you guys know, you know, when you're uh, when you're in the public eye, sometimes you feel a little bit misinterpreted or misunderstood. But uh, tis what it is, as Bill Belichick might say. I want to. I know it's a new year, and I do want to ask some questions about things that are coming up. But I do want to go back just one second. Do you have C thirty right? Thirty years. So much has been accomplished in this time. But I wanted to get your take as far as if you look at the NFL, the NBA, like they're constantly changing things, rules scenarios you know nba had a mid-season tournament we're 30 years in here at Acres, what, baby. Uh, uh, yeah at what stage do you think we're at with mixed martial arts or with the ufc like do you feel like there'll be if we have the same conversation 10 years from now a lot of changes to the sport that we've all grown to love or do you think it'll relatively look the same where we I don't expect way. it's a great question. I don't expect a lot of wholesale changes over the next decade. There are a lot of things that these other sports have that we don't necessarily have in terms of infrastructure, right? You have the worldwide leader in combat sports, the UFC sort of running the show, right? You don't have collective bargaining agreements, you know, you don't even have like a hall of fame or an award show that is voted on by some sort of uh unbiased party, right? So there are a lot of things that we don't necessarily have as a sport. So even when it comes to affecting change, when it comes to giving the judges half points, which I think all of us can agree would uh, would help, you know, it's just hard to make those changes in this current climate. So over the next 10 years, I don't expect a lot, even if all of us can agree that we think elbows should be legal everywhere across all promotions, regardless of angle. And even though we think the referees would be aided by knees to the head of a grounded opponent, even though we don't necessarily want to see a ton of them because of the damage, you know, I just don't think that we're going to see a bunch of change relative to how much chain change we have seen uh, over the last 10 years or 15 years. Yeah. I feel yeah. like we're pretty close. We've hit that sweet spot. Um, 2024. Give me a champion that you believe will hold on to their belt for all of 2024 and the opposite side. Can you tell me what belt do you think was kind of going to be a revolving door of sorts? So it's a really hard question because if I say Islam Makashev, right, um, essentially, am I not picking him over Justin Gaethje or Charles Oliveira? Right. I guess I'm not right. And I guess it's easier maybe when you look at the betting odds and see what they say. Like Alex Pereira right now is plus money to end 2024 as the UFC light heavyweight champion. Now that might be enticing to some people. And I do believe he's the best 205 pound fighter in the world right now. But I also know that he is a champion that wants to stay active. So Sean O'Malley might fight once this year against Marlon Chido Vera. Alex Pereira might defend three times. So I'm trying to dodge the question a little bit. You know, I do think that the middleweight division to George's earlier point is absolutely wild. And Brendan Allen, I think, is the real dark horse. And maybe that's the wrong word to describe him now. But the rear naked choke, baby, right? I mean, the way he has been able to put away elite middleweights of all different stylistic challenges is really something to behold. So I'd love to see a Brendan Allen, Sean Strickland rematch at some point. Of course, Drake is Duplessis is going to have a lot to say about that. I'm very curious how a returning Adesanya might factor in the middleweight equation. And then, of course, Conor McGregor, right? Are they really trying to lay a foundation for him to get a welterweight championship opportunity if indeed he fights Michael Chandler at 70 and not 85? God help us, right? So a lot of moving parts. It shapes up as a big year. It's crazy, right? 2023, 30-year anniversary. You can argue it's as big a year as we ever had. Like when we were trying to hammer down our knockouts of the year, we had a list of 28. You know, just an incredible year. They never tell you what to write on your opening. I see that you are public with it on Instagram, and it, it seems like it's all you. I mean, I don't think they have any any input. What I'm getting at is what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is when you are announcing McGregor versus Chandler at 185, should it be there? Like, how do you even go about like feeding that to the public so that they can consume the fact that two guys that have wore straps at lightweights have mostly fought at lightweights i guess in the case of chandler but, but mcgregor you know did have a, a long a lot of fights at featherweight 
um, how do we feed this to the fans? Because like I told our audience, they're going to sit on a dais and they'll answer all these questions, right? And then one of them will eventually be like, hey, what, what's left to accomplish? And what do they always say? I want to win gold, baby, right? So if they do, and then in the post fight with Joe Rogan or whoever, if they want to go down that route, then shouldn't this fight be at 55, 70 at worst because of the layoff? I pray that that's our reality, brother. I, If I was writing a pay-per-view open, and I do write those myself, I would eliminate the weight class probably, and you're putting me on the spot a little bit, which is fine. I probably would eliminate the weight class from my pay-per-view open and just focus on a return in Conor McGregor. The only defense for that fight happening at middleweight with respect to my friend Conor McGregor is his leg. And if they just don't want him and he doesn't want to cut the weight just to try to have that leg be as strong as humanly possible to try to get through that first fight. But it has no divisional relevance at 85 really doesn't have much at 70. And I have long sort of wished that Conor McGregor would compete more at 155 pounds, right? He has only one lightweight win career-wise in the UFC against Eddie Alvarez. He did not defend the lightweight title, so did not successfully defend the lightweight title. So I don't know. I'd just like to see the man competing uh, at 55, but this fight with Michael Chandler is not going to be at 155 pounds. But yeah, I mean, I just think I'd have to eliminate it from the pay-per-view open process because it just seems like such a stretch. And I really hope for both of their sake that it is at 70 and Connor was just saying that tongue in cheek. I hope the UFC realizes the gem they have in you. Maybe some of these questions, you're right. They do feel like, Oh man, you know, uh, not, not necessarily like a, a setup or anything like that. Cause that's not our jam. But um, what I feel like is they should listen to you. Um, you know, I think it was goes that first asked you, a female commentator, you know, and Laura Sanko specifically, you said something. It got out there in the masses. It picked up, you know, some momentum. And, man, she just had a brilliant year of calling fights. So we think that your voice carries weight. Your opinions carry weight. It's, it shouldn't just be Dana and Hunter and the two matchmakers. I think there should be more of an expanded committee, and I think you should be part of it. So here's another question that I guess has to do with that. Thank you for that. Who, who would you uh, throw in the hat? For a future contributor Hall of Famer, um, you know, we got the modern wing, we got the pioneers, and then the fight wing. But what about when it comes to contributors? Because I feel like that's kind of in your alley, your lanes. So I wonder if at this point in time, Joe Rogan has like respectfully declined a UFC Hall of Fame invitation. It's an eventuality that Joe Rogan's going to go into the UFC Hall of Fame. And I would love for that to happen spontaneously live on a UFC broadcast. To sit here and talk about that man's contributions to the growth of MMA would be such a long conversation. He has just done so much for our sport and for so many individuals within it. I'm coming up on the nine-year anniversary of my podcast. He's the only reason I started the fucking thing, right? So Joe Rogan, first ballot Hall of Famer. I do hope he gets in. And I hope Bruce Buffer follows him shortly thereafter or precedes him because I'd like to see Buffer able to go in, uh, you know, and I guess I can say this right now, um, you know, uh, you know, Bruce Buffer has been dealing with some stuff around the holidays and, um, you know, I just would like to see him get in sooner rather than later. You know, his mother passed away recently and, um, he, oh. he broke that news on the it's time podcast, uh, this week. And, you know, I found myself saying, you know, I would I would love for Bruce to go in when when his mother is still alive, you know, and uh, she was 95 when she passed. And I didn't necessarily take that thought to the masses, you know, or the UFC brass, but I would have loved for uh, her to have been able to see him get that acknowledgement as uh, as his biggest fan. So uh, hopefully Bruce Buffer uh, gets in there soon. Yeah, well, I'm just hearing of that. So, man, sorry to hear that for the Buffer Well, and if I'm breaking news, you know. Uh, you can all sort of send your well wishes to Bruce. It's been an exceedingly hard holiday season for uh, for him. So That's what we'll definitely do. And for anyone that's wondering, well, don't you have to be retired or anything? No, you don't have to be. Mark Ratner is still with the UFC, and he was inducted. And I think one of the beauties of the UFC, it, we may criticize them from time to time with some other decisions they make, but they do, they're an emotional brand and company. And a lot of times it's what, they're feeling and, and a lot of it actually are home runs decisions that they make. And I think somebody that's come on. I mean, those guys are slam dunks. You know what I mean? 
So for sure they should they should be in the Hall of Fame. Do it while while there's they they are still here. We don't have to wait a year or five years. There's no rules. Uh, I think both of those are excellent choices. And yeah. Um, and can I just say, guys, I will fight like hell for Tony Ferguson to get in. I think sometimes the interim champions can become interesting cases, but maybe I won't have to fight for Tony. But if there needs to be a fight for Tony Ferguson to get into the UFC Hall of Fame as a modern era fighter on the merits of his individual accomplishments and not a singular fight like he had against Lando Venator, Edson Barboza, we got to get Ferguson in on the merits of uh, that 12 fight lightweight winning streak. Yeah, you know, Jim Miller said something very similar. He says, that's one of the most impressive things I've ever seen is that 12 fight min win streak. And we had pitched to Jim Miller, by the way. We just had him on. Uh, how about him versus Tony at UFC 300? Even if it's the opening bout. Because remember, Dana White says, you're going to be floored with just the opening bout. I think that's one hell of a way to get the party started. Jim Miller was in. He had lots of great things to say. I think Jim Miller should go into the Hall of Fame, personally, because um, I know we pick on Donald Cerrone a little bit as maybe, you know, he's the bar or something like that. that that's not my intention. My intention is... 40 some fights that he's at, I think 42 with 25 wins, you know, across all these generations of having to uh, learn all these different tactics and defenses, you know, and reinvent yourself and stay healthy and still bring something out of the audience that e erupts every time his song comes out or his name's announced. All this, by, way, by the way, with not really, you know, he, he's not really like got that personal swag or anything to him, you know, he's just kind of like a Johnny Lunch Pail. Yeah, I think it's a tricky thing, right? How do you sort of rate longevity combined with wild success versus a double champion like Daniel Cormier? I think DC has been asked about Jim Miller, and I think it speaks to DC's probably greater thought that there should be like a real true separate of the UFC mixed martial arts Hall of Fame, right? So that you could really differentiate between the undisputed all-time greats and guys who maybe contribute in different ways. Like if I was a voter based upon our criteria right now, yeah, Jim Miller, a hundred percent of the time is a UFC hall of famer. And it hasn't just been volume fights. It's been wins. It's been finishes. It's been exciting fights, promotional workhorse. There are myriad reasons why I think Jim Miller should get into the hall of fame. Should he be at a different wing than Daniel Cormier? Probably. Mm -hmm. Well, they only have four wings so far. <laughs> so I, I would put him in, but um, well, that's the that's... Hall of Fame without a voting body, really, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know exactly how they make those decisions, you know. So I do think at some point when you talk about change, ten years from now, it'd be pretty cool if there was a mixed martial arts Hall of Fame. Hell yeah, because yeah. Fedor's got to be in some sort of a Hall of Fame. You know Has what I mean? To. That Has should be to. the only reason. If there's no other reason for starting an independent mixed martial arts Hall of Fame, it should be so Fedor Emelianenko can be the first inductee. Correct. Um, Bilal Muhammad, I know you get asked about this, and I know you never shy away from an answer, and that's why we really, re really respect you. I saw you, uh, I don't know if campaign's an insulting word or not, but, you know, you were basically outlining why you thought he should be next. And 99% of the world agrees with you, I think. Um, is it difficult? Because I know you're going to do a lot of media. You're going you're gonna to get asked this question for you to balance the fact that you're not being a, a, a Muhammad cheerleader. You're just being asked a question and answering that. And I'm sure that's not the only time uh, this has ever happened. Similar to what Goes is saying, where you're just asked and your brutal honesty sometimes can – does it ever come back to bite you? Oh, for sure. You know, I think my twin brother would like me to touch my top lip to my bottom lip and not be so <laughs> long-winded when it comes to some of these answers. But uh, a lot of it comes with the territory and – I guess maybe even for me, like at times when it comes to offering up an opinion, I try to walk right up to the line and maybe not cross it. But even when it comes to my kids, I tell them the truth will set you free, right? Like yep. it's hard when you guys ask about a Hall of Famer for me to not talk about Bruce Buffer in that way, right? And it's it's easier for me to be truthful, right, than it is to be dishonest. Thankfully, at this stage of my career, there's so much connective tissue between me and all of these athletes that it's really not a big deal, right? Like. Leon Edwards and I are forever connected because of my championship call. Tim Simpson is one of my dearest friends in MMA, and he happens to be his manager, right? So there's a lot of connective tissue on the other side if indeed Bilal Muhammad gets that title fight. But 
You just said 99% of people agree that Bilal Muhammad is the unquestioned number one welterweight contender. So I'm not stepping out on a fucking diving board. I went to bat for Brandon Royval. I've gone to bat for myriad other top contenders in his situation. This is the easiest case that has ever been made. You know, Bilal's unbeaten streak is double digits. He gets no acknowledgement in the pound for pound conversation like these other guys do for whatever reason. I don't know why he's not top 15 pound for pound. It's been a long time since he's realized defeat. And I also think Leon and Bilal are both much better versions of the versions that fought each other in the UFC Apex on short notice in 2021. I just think it's a slam dunk. Even Shavkat Rachmanov, the other name in this equation, has acknowledged Bilal's candidacy. Kamzat Shimaev, I think, is the guy who, you know, should have been a number one welterweight contender, but his health has abandoned him at times. We wish him all the best. You know, there's only one guy to me that could cut the line at 70, and that would be Kamzat Shimaev because... He's undefeated. He was all the rage in the weight class for a time, and uh, he was thrice booked against Leon Edwards. But uh, one of the easiest things for me to do is to hop on a hot microphone and make a case right now for Bilal Muhammad as number one title contender. You know, um, I uh, I remember trying to make the case for Strickland against Adesanya and uh, making a case for Pantoja back in the day. This one seems yeah, pretty cool. easy to me, whether he is uh, in my inner circle or not. And rest assured, once Bilal and Leon hit the tunnel, if indeed that's the fight, last thing I'm thinking about is my friendship with Bilal, the fact that he and my twin brother are best friends. Not thinking about that. Uh, and I think my body of work, hopefully, with the fans uh, allows me a little wiggle room when it comes to some of these interpersonal relationships. It does. You're in Mark Ratner territory, man. Your word means something. Your reputation means something. And you said something important. Us as media... Uh, you as an international superstar broadcaster uh, who we love having on, on the show. <laughs> of course. Um, you know, the same thing we're saying about Bilal, we would say about anyone with a double-digit win streak and the position we're in. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, yeah, you're right. It's not because we've had him on our show or because he's your twin brother's co-host. No, it's the same thing we would do for anybody, any nationality, any color, weight class, same last name as me or whatever. Um, maybe went to my rival school, whatever. No, it's our job. It's you as a fan to decipher whose word do I trust, whose reputation holds up, who's, you know, tends to, I guess, you know, bullshit or whatever. That's not what we do. At least that's not what goes and I do. That's not what you do. We're just asked the question and we ask an opinion. We do it. And it's the same thing we do for anyone else in the same boat. Mm -hmm. And I will add, and thank you for that. We are professional fans at the end of the day. That's what Joe Rogan likes to call us. And I take this job exceedingly seriously, as you all know. But just take me and one of my broadcast partners, the Iron Lung, Paul Felder, right? We're fans of MMA, and we cannot wrap our heads around the fact that even though Islam Akashev is the pound-for-pound -pound king right now, that he would cut the welterweight line and fight right. Leon Edwards and why a lot of people are out there trying to push that fight, Mm. I just don't quite understand that. And, you know, Islam obviously has defended the title now against Alexander Volkanovsky. And even though he has a head-to-head -head win over Charles Oliveira, he hasn't made a defense against a true lightweight. I think a lot of right. us would like to see that just as fans, right? It's not an anti-Islam Akashev take. He's the exactly. number one pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world. But And guess what? He can actually overtake his friend and mentor, Habib. Even though he's lost once and Habib never lost. Habib stopped at three times. Makasha could take this thing to seven or eight, even with the one loss, you know, it's, it's that whole, you know, like, you know, different era thing, like GSP with his nine. Well, as Usman was closing at five, we were starting to consider, could he be greater than GSP, right? He didn't have to get to nine because the more modern fighters right. kind of have rougher roads. Well, this one's a clear cut case. Where I bet you even Habib would say, yeah, that is the greatest if he were to rack him up, but you got to do him against some lightweights, baby. You know, Gamrot was an alt, uh, alternate, they still went past him and brought back a uh, featherweight, badass featherweight. I have no problems with Volkanovski. Yeah. Badass first fight that they've had. But no, we need to see what the uh, lightweight title defenses before we even think about all these guys jumping around. I had a go at these guys on Monday spinning back <laughs> yeah. as well. So I'm glad you brought that, brought that up. Well, I think there's a balancing act between the financial and the aspirational when it comes to title defenses and championships. And if you're Islam Akashev, and the fans and people want to see you try to become a double champion, right? He has a family as well, right? I mean, I am certainly not criticizing Islam Akashev for taking the bait, so to speak, and leaning into it. Uh, I'm just hoping that order can be restored a little bit. And uh, this is one division where things are pretty, pretty clear, at least to me. Yeah.
John, I know you got to go, but I'll say this fast. We just did the top 30 greatest fighters in UFC history on MMA Junk. I don't know if you I caught saw. it. Guess who was at the top? At the top was GSP, John Jones. We can debate that all day if it should be one or two or whatever. Demetrius Johnson, Anderson Silva. Guess what all those guys have? Lots of title defenses. This champ champ thing, I think, is just – it's uh, a small era that we're going through. Um, and – but it, it's it's the, of course it's phenomenal respect right it's pretty iconic to do that, but it doesn't make you one of the greatest in my opinion at least to, through what I've seen and heard discussing with other media members that I respect fans that you know that I respect and uh, fighters themselves when they talk about it the, the the champ champ thing is nice if it's more lucrative God bless you but if you're looking for that legacy and to be in that Mount Rushmore or whatever it's those title defenses. Title defenses is the number one statistic in MMA. I've said this to you guys before. I don't necessarily consider John Jones a 15-time UFC champion. I guess it might be 16 now, right? But if they were hanging banners in Albuquerque, New Mexico, every time he won a world title, right, he'd have, you know, almost as many as the Celtics and Lakers. So, Ooh, yes. We end we end fist bumping and giving each other props. I love it. Thank you, John Anik, for the time, as always. Uh, and I hope you have a great 2024 that goes for you and your family and can't wait to hear your call of the fights at UFC 297 in Toronto and beyond. What a great, uh, lineup of events that you guys have already just in the first quarter. I can't wait. Well, thank you boys. Thanks for the extended time. And, uh, you know, the answer is always yes. So don't be strangers. We'll talk to you in a month or so. See wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did he just say that? Because well, we've been I dying to get you on though. spinning back click. I guess the only time I've turned goes down is when he tries to tap into my creative side, right? He'll ask me to like sing something for him on (laughs) relatively short notice, but I've never turned down MMA junkie radio. Not one time. Oh, spinning back click. Will you do that? Our Monday show. uh, Yeah. It's noon Eastern 9 a.m. Pacific. I don't know what your Mondays are like. Noon Eastern 9 a.m. Pacific. Monday noon Eastern. That's right in the middle of the Anakin Florian podcast. But for you guys, if you give me enough notice, we can pivot off of that slot for a week. All right, we're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do it. Thanks, John. Take care, buddy. Thank you, boys. Looking good. See you soon.